If you have your Bibles, uh, you can go ahead and turn with me, begin turning with me um, to Matthew chapter 4 and then also Matthew chapter 12. Uh, you can just mark those two spots. I'll actually read about uh, three or four, maybe four or five different passages of Scripture, just very short passages of Scripture as we begin this morning to set the stage uh, for what we're going to talk about today. But Pastor Matt, thank you so much for having us. And Sister Danielle, we just love you guys so much. We honor you. And uh, aren't you thankful for your pastors? Amen. 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 Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah. Uh, I really believe with all of my heart that God has given you shepherds uh, that are after His heart and that desire to feed you with the Word of God in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I believe that with all of my heart and I pray that you see that and you're appreciative of them. And if you haven't told them in a while, maybe today after church, just remind them how much you love them and you appreciate them. He embarrassed me, so I'll I'll embarrass him a little bit. Uh, Just be sure to remind them how much you love them and appreciate them and uh, for the work that they're involved in and just, just really doing what it is that God's called them to do in this time and in this hour. Matthew chapter 4, I'm I'm going to read verses 23 and 24 here in Matthew 4. And then like I said, I'm going to uh, read a couple of other passages of Scripture as we begin. You don't have to turn all over the place with me. I just want to set a uh, a stage for the things we're going to deal with today. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, those which were possessed with, the, with devils and those which were uh, lunatic or, or epileptics, uh, those that had the palsy, those who were uh, paralyzed, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people. Now I'm going to turn over to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus, reiterating the same point midway through his ministry, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And then I want to turn to Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 18. Uh, This was a prophecy spoken in the Old Testament that was now being fulfilled through the life of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will, and at this time it could have been said, I have put my spirit upon him and he shall show justice to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets A bruised reed, verse 20, this is really where I want to draw your attention. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax he shall not quench, until he sends forth judgment or justice unto victory. And in his name, the name of Jesus, shall the Gentiles trust. And I want to minister a message this morning simply entitled, What moves the heart of God? What moves the heart of God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, God, for this time that you have given us together today as the body of Christ. Father, I thank you for those that are here today that are your people, those that have been bought with your blood and filled with your Holy Spirit. God, thank you, God, that you have called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. God, thank you for the privilege, God, that we have of participating with you in your kingdom causes and advancements in the earth in this time and in this hour in which we live. Father, I'm thankful, God, that you're not just 
a stale God, a God that is unable to be moved or reached. But God, your word tells us, God, that even as Jesus, when he was in this world, you are a God that is moved with compassion over the hurts and the ails of the entirety of the human race. Yes. And God, there may be a believer here today who is hurting and who is broken, God. They're experiencing heartache, God, because of sin's effects in their lives. And I just pray, God, that you would restore unto them their hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. That you would renew their strength and their confidence in you today. And Father, if there would be those here today that are not believers, God, they've, they've not entered into a relationship with you by faith. Father, I just ask, oh God, that you would make it very plain and very clear today, your heart concerning them where they are. God, that you have not come to crush them and to rob them of the little life that they have left. God, religion may do that, but you do not. God, that you would just reveal your heart for them today. You would reveal your love for them. You would reveal what a great price you paid to pardon their souls, God, to buy their souls, oh God. Father, reveal your heart and your mind to us today in this service. We're in desperate need of you, God. I'm just asking, God, that over the next few moments, God, you would give me the anointing of the Holy Spirit that I so desperately need to share this word of God today. God, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, and give us a heart to receive what the Spirit is saying to us in this moment and in this time. And when it's all said and done, as we do now, we'll be sure to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. Very early on in the ministry of Jesus, it became abundantly clear what his mission was. It could be summed up, it can be culminated in these words, that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came for the sole purpose of relieving mankind of the negative effects that sin had brought about on the human race. To redeem man from this heavy hand of sin and of Satan that had borne down on men's lives from generation to generation. The ministry of Jesus as we see at the very outset was a ministry that was marked by compassion rather than condemnation. Jesus, knowing that man was already condemned because of his sinful state, came with compassion, desiring to deliver mankind from this wretched place and condition. Condemnation is the default position of man. Man is born in sin. It means that man, when he's, Jeremiah would say that man is but a few days old and he's full of trouble. It's because mankind is born at enmity with God. Because of sin, all men outside of relationship with Jesus are condemned. It means that they're declared to be reprehensible, wrong. They're pronounced guilty. And Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says that the wages of sin of this condemnation is death. This because of the severance that man's sin brought about between he and God whenever man fell in the garden. Whenever man fell in the garden, the life and the light of God that was present in his life, it was taken away. Sin robbed man, not only of the life of God, but it robbed him of having any, any inability of ever being a testimony for God in the earth again. However, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God made a promise to the human race that I'm not going to leave you in this dreadful condition without sending an answer for you to get out of it. I'm going to send one who is going to be anointed by my spirit to crush the authority and the power of the evil one, the devil. He would send one, God would, anointed by the spirit of God to crush the authority of this one who had authored all sorts of evil and wickedness in the earth 
the devil. This was God's promise yes. to the human race. Amen. Yes. In John chapter 3, there was a man by the name of Dick Nicodemus that came to Jesus. Nicodemus was a reputable, respected, and revered man. He was a religious man. He was known for his religiosity in that day and in that hour. And this man, Nicodemus, he began to question Jesus one day about the reality and the veracity of his ministry. The Bible says that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. He didn't want to know that he didn't want people to know that he was inquiring about this Christ because his religion was contrary to the life that Jesus was offering. And if they knew that he was in fellowship, in communion and relationship with this Christ, the religion that he had been birthed in and birthed out of would have crushed him. And so the Bible says that Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night and he begins to question Question Jesus about the reality and the veracity of his ministry. Nicodemus recognized, he realized that Jesus was different than the religious leaders Amen. of the day. Amen. Jesus did not walk the streets of Jerusalem purporting some meaningless, lifeless, powerless religion. There was something of reality and life and power to this Christ and to his ministry. Yes. There was an awareness, whether they admitted it or not, there was an awareness in people's hearts that what this man had, what he possessed or what possessed him, had the ability to change and rearrange men and women's yes. lives. It wasn't just a meaningless life form of some type of religion, what was in this Christ literally had the ability to change the hearts and the lives of men. Yes. The Bible says there was a moment when Jesus began to stand up and teach. They said, man, we've heard those scriptures so many times before, but that man speaks with an authority like we've never known, seen, or witnessed before. There's something of life there. It's not the day meaningless religion that we've grown up hearing and adhering to all of our lives. There's something that when he talks, my inner man is moved. There's something on the inside of me, this emptiness, this void on the inside of me bears witness that I must have what it is that he has. There's something inside of me that says this man is different from all other men. He has the ability to change men's lives, not just offer them empty promises. Nicodemus recognized this about Jesus. Times when people would literally wonder in amazement at the authority with which Jesus spoke and ministered. And so in John chapter 3, and I'm just going to move through this quickly, Beginning in verses 14 through verses 18, Jesus begins to give to Nicodemus a summation of who he is and what it is that he's come to do. In John chapter 3, and I'll turn there very quickly if you would, uh, you can turn with me. John chapter 3 and verse 14, this is in the middle of Jesus' uh, explanation or summation uh, to Nicodemus. And Jesus says this in verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, verses 14 and 15 of John chapter 3, they're a direct reference to a story uh, given to us in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. Now, it's important to understand this, to understand what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus here. In Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9, uh, the people of Israel, the people of God, had sinned greatly against the Lord. They had murmured and they had complained 
time and time again, up until the point that God began to allow wrath and judgment to come upon them. And in this story, in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9, God Himself, He sent fiery, which, which means poisonous serpents, among the people. And those serpents began to bite the people and infect them with their poison. And as a result, Numbers chapter 21 and verse 6 tells us that there was a whole multitude of people that died because of this judgment that God had allowed. It didn't just infect or affect a few people. It affected a multitude of people. And I want you to think of it. And there were thousands upon thousands of people that were infected. And just think of it for a moment. Even those who had not been directly infected by this bite of the serpent, no doubt they had friends and family members and acquaintances that they witnessed being infected by this poison of the serpent. So in one way or another, everyone was affected by the poison of the serpent. You see, what Jesus, I believe, was trying to get across to Nicodemus that day is that sin is no respecter of persons. In one way or another, this sin, the sin nature, it affects all men. And if, the, and if there is no remedy, death and separation from God will always be the result. But I'm thankful that Numbers 21 doesn't stop at verse 6. Because the Bible says that the people of God, after this judgment came, the people of God began to cry out to Him for deliverance. They had sinned. They did not deserve deliverance. They didn't deserve rescue. They didn't deserve salvation. They did not deserve grace. But God, in His mercy offers them a way of deliverance. And in Numbers chapter 21 verse 7, the Bible says that the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And so God was saying to that people that anyone who is infected by this poison of the serpent, when he just looks upon the pole, he shall live. Not when he does good, not when he tries to figure a way out of his dilemma, but when he beholds the serpent on the pole, he shall live. This was a picture, Jesus, getting back to the conversation with Nicodemus, this was a picture of Jesus taking your sin and my sin to the cross of Calvary. And what Jesus was telling Nicodemus in John 3 verses 14 through 16 is that if any man affected by the poison of sin, yeah. which is all men, yeah. Yeah. but if yeah. any man affected or infected by that poison will simply look in faith to me and what I'm going to do at the cross, he shall be saved. He shall be redeemed. He shall be reconciled. He shall be rescued from from this poison of the serpent. Yes, Lord. God didn't have to bring deliverance. We were so unworthy of it, so rebellious, so lost and without God, trying to find ways by which we could please Him and earn His salvation and earn His righteousness. God says that to me. I don't want that. He says, I'm going to make a way. Where there is no other Amen. way. He didn't have to bring deliverance. But he did. And so Jesus ministry. Culminating in Calvary. Was a plea from the heart of God. That you and I do not have to suffer. The judgment and the defeat of sin. All of our lives. 
If we will look, if we will behold by faith the one who came for us, we can be delivered from this place of judgment and condemnation. You see, Jesus did not come to condemn because we were already condemned. Jesus came to free us and to save us from this place of condemnation and separation from God. Now, you know, there's something about the venom of a poisonous snake that even if death is prevented, there can still be lasting effects on the body. Yeah. Even if death is prevented, there can be long lasting effects upon the body of someone who has been infected by the poison of a venomous snake. Sickness, paralysis, nerve damage for the rest of your life. This is a very real thing. And I believe the implication of the text is also this, that not only did Jesus come and desire to redeem us from sin itself. I believe it was also the negative effects of sin brought about in the human race that Jesus died to save us from. Yes. Yes. This hurt, this harm, this heartache that sin brings. That's all sin can do. That's all that a life separated from God can give us. It'll never offer us anything else. No matter how good or how pleasant life may seem in the moment, sooner or later, sin can only do one thing, and that is bring about hurt and harm and heartache into our lives. And every one of us have been recipients of those effects of sin in our lives. Not just prior to our salvation That's experience, right. but even since our salvation experience, you and I have had to face these lasting effects of sin. The hurt and the harm and the heartache that sin brings into our life. Jesus said it very clearly in John chapter 10 and verse 10, that the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy but I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35 that Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Watch verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. The sicknesses and diseases, the demonic oppression, this sense of hopelessness and shame in the hearts and lives of those in Jesus' day, they were direct results of man being infected in the garden by that poison of the serpent. Now, I'm not saying that people were sick or ill or demonically oppressed or hopeless because of some sin that they themselves had committed. But I am saying that the entrance of sin into the world was the root cause of all, all of the hurts and the ills of man. And when Jesus saw man in this condition, in this wretched place, in this place where man was enfeebled and weak and weary, this place where man was hurt and despondent, this place where man had been scattered abroad by the effects of sin. When Jesus saw the human race in this condition, the Bible says that he was moved with compassion. To be moved with compassion, it speaks of this deep inner yearning of God that caused Jesus to have this feeling of deep distress as he witnessed the ills of those who were affected by sin. He looked upon the human race and his inner man was moved to such a degree. There was this deep yearning 
and groaning and grieving within his spirit because now with his eyes, he's beholding the effects that sin has had upon the entirety of the human race. The Bible says that as he looked on them, he was moved with compassion because they fainted. Fainted means to be enfeebled through exhaustion. It means to grow weak or weary, to be despondent and to become faint hearted. And so the Bible is telling us that the people in Jesus' day were overwhelmed by the ills of life to the point of utter exhaustion. And then the Bible says that Jesus looked, in them, looked at them and he realized that they were scattered abroad. It means that they had no sense of hope or direction for their lives. And I want you to know that this compassion in Christ it did not cause him to sit idly by hoping or wishing that something good would happen for these people. This compassion in the heart of Jesus Christ, it moved him to action. He didn't just say, man, this is really bad. This is a really bad condition. No, what was in him, it literally moved him to where these people were. And this is what the entire ministry of Jesus, from, from, from the time of his baptism, all the way to the cross, this is what the ministry of Jesus consisted of. Being moved towards, not away from, but being moved towards those who were in desperate need. Toward those who, were, who needed healing. Toward those who needed deliverance. Toward those who needed salvation. This compassion in the heart of Christ, it moved him toward those who could offer or present to him nothing but a heart of faith. They could present to him no measure of righteousness. They could present to him no form of godliness. They could present to him nothing in and of themselves. The only thing that they could present to, to, to him was their sin and their faith. That was it. And the Bible tells us that he came to them. And he offered to relieve the burden and the shame. He came and he offered them a sense of hope and sure direction for their lives. In Matthew chapter 11, uh, verses 28 through 30, Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and I am lowly of heart, and you shall find rest to your souls. His invitation to the human race was not come and show me how much good you can do. It was not come and figure out a way to reach me and then I'll bless you. His offer to man was just come by faith. All of you who are weary, all of you who are burdened, all of you who have been hurt and harmed by the ills and the ills of sin, come to me and I will give you rest. Yes. You've been under a yoke of bondage all of your life but Jesus is saying I want to put the yoke of salvation and freedom and deliverance upon your life I don't want sin to be ruling and leading you every step of the way you know what a yoke was? It's when two oxen would get under this big piece of wood and they would be tied around their necks and they would work together for a purpose and many times there would be one oxen that was much stronger than the other. Many times they would take these young oxen that hadn't learned how to plow yet and they would put them, put them with this more experienced and mature oxen. And really what was happening at the beginning stages, that young oxen had no idea what to do. But that older oxen, he would pull them and he would jerk them and he would lead the way. There was no choice for that younger oxen but to follow the older and you know, that's how it is before we're in Christ Jesus, before we know his grace and his mercy in our lives. We're led to and fro by sin. We have no choice. It's our master. It leads us where it wants us to go. But Jesus said, if you will come to me, I'll take that yoke off of you. As a matter of fact, 
I have the anointing upon me that is able to destroy that yoke. Not just to open it a little bit and cause you to figure out the rest of the way. No, the anointing that is upon my life has the ability to crush that yoke and to put you in a brand new one. And this new one, it's not going to be rigorous and it's not going to be about bondage and driving you to do what you don't want to do and be who you don't want to be. No, this is going to be my yoke and I'm going to lead you in green pastures. I'm going to lead you beside the still waters. And even at times when you have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be with you. Yes. And I'm not there to beat you up and throw you away. I'm there to lead you to where you need to be. Hallelujah. I'm there to give you freedom. Hallelujah. Come was his invitation. Come to me. And so Jesus came to them and he offered to relieve the burden and the shame. He comes and he offers them a sense of hope and true direction for their lives. You don't have to bear the burden anymore. You don't have to carry the weight of sin a day longer. You don't have to stay in prison by the shame and the guilt that sin has brought into your life. Jesus is saying to that generation and he's saying to us today that if you will come to me, I will free you of the burden and I will walk with you and I will give you a sure and a definite purpose and direction for your life. That's his call to us today. And I implore you by the Holy Ghost that if you can hear his voice today, do not harden your heart. Hear what the Holy Ghost is yes. saying to you today. Because the Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised next week. If God the Holy Ghost is dealing with that heart right now, I implore you, I beseech you, uh, brother and sister, make it right with God. Respond to Him in faith today and allow Him to make of your life what it can never be in and of your own strength Hallelujah. and in and of your own power. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. The Bible says that Jesus went about Matthew 4, all Galilee, teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all manner of sickness and disease among the people. And his, frames, his fame spread all throughout the land. The word healed there, it speaks of relieving or healing or curing miraculously. And it's not just, I don't believe, speaking of physical disease and infirmities. But as we've said earlier, it's speaking of the lasting effects and torments that sin brings in a life. I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus can save you from the lasting effects and torments that sin has brought into your life. Thank you, Jesus. He doesn't offer to you just life in the life to come. He offers you life now. Yes. And the life that He offers you is an abundant life. Yes. It is a life of excess. And what I mean by excess is not enjoying the things of this world. What I mean by excess is that when God saves you. It's just the beginning yes. of what God has for you. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Salvation is just the start. Mm -hmm. It's just God beginning mm -hmm. to give you His life. Mm -hmm. And as you walk with Him in faith, little by little, He reveals more and more of that life to you. And He says to you, come and come again. Come and come again. Come and appropriate everything that I died for you to have. And maybe you say today, I have nothing to offer him. All I feel is distress and brokenness and pain because of what sin has done to my life. But I'm here to tell you that if you see your need for this salvation, if you see your need for this healing, if you see your need for this deliverance of God in your life, then you have exactly what it is that Jesus is looking for. Yeah. You search your Bible, 66 books from Genesis to Revelation. 
And every time someone presented God with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, he never turned them away. There were a lot of people who offered him their own goodness and he had to turn them away. But you search your Bible from Genesis to Revelation and I can promise you, you, you will not find one instance in that word of God where somebody genuinely offered God a broken and a contrite spirit, a weak and a dampened spirit, and God turned that person away. Jesus is concerned about hurt people. Yes. Yes. People who have been hurt by the affairs of life. Yes. People that have been hindered along life's journey by some unfortunate circumstance that has befallen them. Some hurt, some uh, a harm, some heartache that has come into their lives because of sin. You know, much of the religious crowd in Jesus' day, they sought to slay him. But those who were truly broken and battered and bruised by sin, they sought to touch him. And I am so thankful that Jesus was not untouchable. He was not unreachable and he was not unapproachable. And can I tell you that in the time and hour in which we are living, Jesus is still approachable. Jesus is still touchable. And Jesus is still reachable. The Bible says that he can be touched by the feelings of your infirmities. He can be moved by that which has moved you. He can be touched by that which has brought hurt and heartache into your life. The Bible says that our high priest is not just another religious man. He's one who has identified with man in their brokenness and in their despair. And he says to you, because I know what you feel and because I've made a way for you, you can come boldly to the throne of grace. And at that throne of grace, you can expect to obtain mercy and to find grace to help you in your time of need. You can come boldly to the throne of God today in the name of Jesus. And you can know with a heart of faith, with a heart of assurance, with a heart filled with confidence that this God desires to save you and to restore you and to heal you. Amen. Your weakness your sin, your brokenness, your helplessness, it does not intimidate God. As a matter of fact, it draws Him to you. If you're weak and you're broken and you're filled with sin today, you're the exact one that Jesus is looking for. And I just stopped by today on a mission from God to tell you that God loves you and He wants you. He's not intimidated by your weakness or your sin. If those things draw Him to you, Hallelujah. He is moved by you. Yes, He's moved by you today. Yes. What moves the heart of God? It's you. Yes. You say, well, I know the preacher. Yeah, because he does so much good and he preaches and he does all of these. No, 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 no. God is moved yes. by you. You, yes. no matter how weak or how insignificant you might feel this morning, no matter how broken you may feel, God says to you, you move me. Yes. When I see you, there is something on the inside of me that yearns for your good. Yes. Yes. There's something in me that yearns for your betterment and for your welfare. There's something in me that yearns. To give you yes, Lord. everything Hallelujah. that Jesus died for Hallelujah. on the cross of Calvary. Hallelujah. He delights Hallelujah. to come Hallelujah. and be your strength. Hallelujah. He delights to come and to heal you of your brokenness. He delights to come and to fill you with hope in the midst of your helplessness. He delights in saving men. He delights in healing men. He delights in restoring men. And you say, but I've come to him a hundred times and I'm still hurt and I'm still filled with despair and with heartache. God says to you, come again. Yes. You can't wear me out. You may get weary and you may get tired. 
But your God does not grow weary. He never tires. He never faints. And his promise to those who are weak and weary and fading away is that if you will wait upon me, I will renew your strength. I will cause you to mount up with wings like eagles. I'll cause you to run and not faint. I'll cause you to walk and not become weary. You may be weary, but I'm not. So don't worry about wearying me with what it is that's plaguing your life. Come to me. And I'll save you. Yes. Yes, Lord. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 20. I'm not going to read the whole passage for the sake of time. I'm coming to a close, but Matthew 12 and verse 20. This is a Old Testament prophecy that's being fulfilled through the life of Jesus. We're being told what the purpose of Jesus coming was. And Matthew 12 and 20 says this, that a bruised reed shall he not break. And a smoking flax he will not quench until he send forth judgment unto victory. Very quickly, the bruised reed, it spoke of a plant. But this plant, it was a tender plant. The plant, the reed was, it was used for all sorts of different things in that day, but it was very easily shaken. It was very easily moved by the wind. And if you handled it a little too roughly, if you handled it with a little too much pressure, it would very easily, it would lose its structure, it would lose its strength, and it would become weakened. And many times, if it was handled too roughly, it would be broken altogether. <laughs> and so the beginning of this prophecy is saying that a bruised reed, and the reed speaks of me and you. The reed is symbolic of us as humanity. We're easily moved. We're easily broken. And the ministry of Jesus was to come and not to finish off the job. The ministry of Jesus was to come and to bring healing where there was brokenness. To come and to bring strength where there was weakness. And then not only a bruised reed will he not crush, but a smoking flax he will not flinch. The smoking flax, it spoke of a, a, a lamp. And many times if that lamp was left unattended, if the lamp was left without oil, or if the, if the trim had gone, uh, if the wick had gone untrimmed, many times the fire of that lamp, the light that that lamp was intended to be portraying and sending out, the light, the fire would begin to flicker. And all you would have left on the top of that lamp was just an ember. All you would have left, it looked like, was just flax, just, uh, just ashes. It seemed like all it was. And that's you and I. We're the lamp. And many times we find ourselves in a place where we're lacking oil. And many times the, 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 the wick in our lives has not been trimmed. And because of it, the light of Jesus is not burning through our lives in the way and in the measure that it once did or in the way that it needs to be. And His Word to us is that when I find that smoldering lamp, I'm not going to come and put a cap on it so that it goes out altogether. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come and I'm going to trim the wick. And it may be painful to trim the wick, but I've got to get off that useless excess if this fire is going to burn bright again. But don't worry, because once I trim that wick, I'm going to fill you with fresh oil so that your lamp can be what it was always intended to be. Jesus, in essence, Matthew 12 and 20 is saying that Jesus was not coming to crush mankind. Mankind was already crushed and faltering under the weight of sin. The only thing that Jesus was coming to crush was the godless religious system that was crushing the spirit and the faith of people. The only thing that Jesus came to crush was the authority and the power that Satan had had over mankind. He was coming to extinguish that fire. And he was coming to break that reed. To put an end to it. Other than that, Jesus was coming to save. His heart was never to crush. It never has been. 
You remember at the end of Jesus' ministry, He stands over Jerusalem. A people that He offers life to for three and a half years. A people that He offers hope to. Salvation, deliverance, rescue, redemption. For three and a half years, He exhausts Himself day and night. Being in communion with the Father and preaching to the people of that day. But they reject Him. And at the end of His ministry, Jesus stands over Jerusalem and He begins to weep and He says, Oh, Jerusalem, the things I would have done for you. The glories of God I would have bestowed upon your life. The salvation of God I would have brought to you. The freedom of God. The presence of God you could, you could have known it in a tangible and a real way. But you would not let me. I wanted to do so much for you. And I was not asking of you anything other than your faith. I was not asking you to get it all together. I was just asking you to repent of your sin and turn to me and I would save you and I would redeem you and I would make you. The temple of God wouldn't be that temple in Jerusalem that was built with hands. You would become the temple of God. You would become the habitation of God by the Spirit. This God who created heaven and earth and sea and sky and all that in them is. He would have come and He would have lived and resided in your heart. Yes. That life and presence of God that Moses craved. The life and presence of God that men like David, your forefathers, men like yes. them, they craved for this presence. Yes. They would say things as the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longs for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for the living God. What David could have never experienced before the cross, I would have given it yes. to you freely. Oh, but you wouldn't hear me. Oh, help us. You wouldn't say yes to me. This life is available to us. Men and women. But we must hear His voice. We must respond to this God in faith. If we hear His voice, I plead with you today. Do not harden your heart. Because I'm telling you, the more you harden your heart, the easier it will be to harden your heart. The more that you say no to this gracious offer of, of Jesus Christ, the more that you say no to this wonderful, gracious, merciful offer of God through His Son, Jesus, the easier it will be to say no. But if you say yes, everything that you read about in the Bible, in the New Testament Scriptures, all of the power and the ability and the blessings and the favor of God that you witness these men and women walk in, it is yours. Yes. The moment that you express faith in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, many in our day, just as in that day, and they had a right and a reason to. They believe that the Bible is full of rigor rigorous rules and demands given by some ruthless ruler meant to bring dread and fear into people's lives. But for the believer in Christ, the Word of God is rich Amen. with life and grace and comfort. It is full of incredible promises and gifts given to you by God Himself. John the Apostle once wrote, His commandments are not grievous. They're not dreadful. They're not because I realize His love and His mercy and His grace in those things. And just like Jerusalem, there were those in Jesus' day who felt that they could do without Jesus. They felt as though they could go without a touch from Him. Nia, would you come please? They felt as though they could go without a word from Him. That they could go without His ministry in their lives. And you know what? The Bible says He passed them by. 
Jesus one time went to his hometown of Nazareth, the place that he was raised. And he went there with every intention and purpose of doing mighty and miraculous things among the people. But the Bible says when he got there, he was hindered. He could not do what it is that he was desiring to do. And it was not because of diseases or demons. It was not because of sin or sickness or Satan. Those were not the things that hindered Jesus. What hindered them was the unbelief of the people for whom he came. And Jesus passed Nazareth by. And I don't know that those people ever realized, maybe until they died, what exactly they had missed out on. Never realizing who they had forsaken. But to those who knew that they needed Him. To those who knew that they could not go without a touch from Him. To those who knew that they could not go without His Word or His ministry in their lives. The Bible is full of instances where Jesus came and He met them where they were. Those who said, I can't go without a touch. Those like blind Bartimaeus who says, mock me and accuse me all that you want. But this is my moment. This is my opportunity. Jesus is passing by. I've never seen him with my eyes, but I've heard the stories about what he could do. I heard the stories about how he could heal the sick and raise the dead and open blinded eyes like mine. I've heard the stories, the rumors about this man. And if it's true that it's him walking in the streets, I'm not going to let him pass me by without getting a touch from him. And the Bible says that Jesus stops the whole multitude because of the cries of one man. Jesus is busy. There's multitudes thronging him. And he's on a mission. He's going somewhere else. He's not going there for Bartimaeus. He's on the road and he's going somewhere else. He's on another mission. But the cry of one broken man, it stopped Jesus in his tracks. And he said, I will not take a step further until I honor this faith that I see before me. to refuse anyone who comes to him in faith. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what kind of condition you think that you're in. I don't care what people have said about you. I don't care what the lies of the enemy have purported in your mind over and over again. He says to you, just come to me in faith. Just offer me your heart and I'll give you my life. Just give me your life and I'll give you mine. I'll place within you the life of God. I'll give you the Holy Ghost. I'll give you all of the blessings and the gifts of heaven. If you would just believe me, will you stand with me this morning? Oh, Christ of God. Oh, Holy Lamb of God. Oh, my God, we sense your presence today. Oh, my God. This Jesus, he receives. He redeems and He restores all who come to Him in their weakness and in their brokenness. It says of all that came to Him with a heart of faith that He healed them all. None were excluded or left out. He met them in their brokenness and He brought them deliverance. scripture in the Psalms as we close. Believers, would you pray in the Holy Ghost right now? Just in your heart. Doesn't have to be out loud unless you want it to be, but just pray in the Spirit right now. Just be sensitive to God in this moment. God's working in this house this morning. He's moving in our midst. Hallelujah. The psalmist said in Psalms chapter 34 and verse 4, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened 
They were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. Verse 6, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Down to verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. Verse 17, the righteous cry, and the Lord hears, and the Lord delivers them out of all of their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. None of them that trust in him shall be ashamed. Father, I thank you for this moment in time, this day in history, that I believe from before the foundations of the world you orchestrated. You planned it out, God. God, from before the time when you created this earth, you knew every person that would be sitting in this building this morning. You knew every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl that would be here today feeling overwhelmed by the ails of life, feeling crushed in spirit, bound by a sense of hopelessness and despair. You knew every individual that would be here today. And God, I just pray that something that was said this morning would stir their hearts, oh God, to respond to you right now in faith. That God, regardless of how broken or hopeless or sinful they feel this morning, God, that hope was made alive in them by the Holy Ghost to know that this God has not forgotten them and this God has not forsaken them. God, that you came even, even if it was just for them. Oh God, I thank you that you were that man on a journey. And one day you came across a field and in that field you found a, a pearl of great price. And God, the Bible says that you purchased the whole field if it meant that you could get just that one pearl that was precious to you. God, if it meant that you could get just one person in here today, I believe you would have did what you did at Calvary a thousand, a million times over. If it was just for one, you would have done it. Because that is your love and your compassion and your mercy to us, God. Oh, God, reveal yourself. Your presence is here, Lord. Father, we yield to you right now, Holy Spirit. And we say, come, God, and have your way in this place. I want to implore you, if you're here today, and you feel the tug of God on your heart, you say, I've never felt this before. Or maybe I felt it in some measure, but I'm feeling it again today, and God is dealing with me. I don't know how to explain what it is that's going on on the inside of me. I just know that something is moved in my heart. I want to encourage you. Let God save you today. Let Him redeem you. Let Him save you from the grip of sin. You don't have to live one day longer without hope. You don't have to live a day longer without a sense of sure direction and purpose for your life. You don't have to go a moment longer wondering what's going to happen to me and my family and all these other things. There can be a confidence in your life that this God who is able to save you, He's also able to lead you and guide you and provide for you and take care of you for the rest of your life. Oh God. I just want to ask you that if you feel that tug of the Spirit on your heart today, would you come to this altar, please? And I promise there's nobody up here that will embarrass you. I promise nobody's going to laugh at you. I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're going to be surrounded by a group of believers who have been redeemed themselves, 
who one day made a decision for themselves to say yes to this Christ, would you come this morning? And secondly, I'll say this this morning, if you need God to touch you, if there is need of healing in your life, deliverance in your life, you don't have to tell me what's going on. But I believe that God wants to meet you here today. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. Maybe you're saying there's this sense of hopelessness in my life that I've not experienced in a long time. I'm hurt. I'm full of despair and brokenness and I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm making a mess of things. I'm telling you the best thing for you to do is to offer God your heart today. Let somebody pray with you and believe with you. As Naya sings, I'm going to ask you, if, if you fall into any of those categories, please come to this altar and let the Holy Spirit minister to you through other believers in this body.